Joining us now, MSNBC political analyst and publisher of the newsletter, The Inc., Anand Giridardis, and the co-host of MSNBC's The Weekend, Simone Sanders Townsend. So, Anand, uh, Mika and I, Anand, uh, Mika and I were having a conversation in between breaks. Yeah. And, and she disagrees with me. Uh, but, I do. But Alex reminds me that, that, that my argument uh, sort of goes parallel with what you're saying anyway. My argument is this. Trump always gets away with it. Anybody else that did what he did on I... January 6th would be in jail by now. Anybody else. And we can go case by case by case. We can talk about nuclear secrets, stealing the nuclear secrets, telling your IT guy, destroy the nuclear secrets. When he wouldn't do it, telling your maintenance guy, flood the IT room. All of this. And yet, I'm sorry, I think he's going to get away with it because he get because the law does not apply to Donald Trump. I don't know why it doesn't. And a lot of times in this case, they're self-inflicted wounds. But somehow he always gets away with it, which leads to your point, which is this. Folks, we got to beat him at the ballot box. If we're going to destroy the radicalism of Trumpism, we've got to do it at the ballot box. Don't expect a magical judgment to come from a courtroom. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I think it's, uh, this has now happened enough times that in enough different cases, in different jurisdictions, um, that it's not a coincidence or it's not circumstantial. You know, everybody else is playing white shoe law, and this guy's playing mafia law, and it works. Um, and and I, I just want to say, you know, I, I don't want to disagree with the lawyers who came before. I'm sure they're right about the law. It is infuriating that people make, you know, have personal uh, foibles that mess up such an important case. But I, I, two doses of perspective here for a second. This is a case about racketeering and not racketeering to like make some money behind a laundromat. This is a case about racketeering to end American democracy. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are people in that DA's office who as flawed human beings got into a loving relationship and took some trips. By the way, one thing I take away from this is more Americans should keep this flame alive the way they did restaurants, nice trips, cruises. Um, but these are people who are normal human beings who made mistakes, who are, remind, to remind us all, up against someone who tried to end American democracy, which is the substance of the case. Doesn't mean what they did is right, but let's just remember what this is about. Uh, and well, the second uh, point is, as they said, it, and, uh, as uh, you, you read through this, the judge isn't worried about that personal relationship. The judge is worried about what they did after there was an investigation into the personal relationship. I agree. So, but uh, and, even, and even I would, their behavior argue, in that. I would argue if this is a racketeering case to end democracy, which I believe it is, then you've got to take extra care. Yeah, right? I, I, I agree with that. I, I just want to put it in perspective. This is a, this is a mistake around a loving consensual relationship in a case against a guy who has been found liable for rape and who has been credibly accused in many right. circumstances of non-consensual relations with women. So, well, again... And, and they, also a guy, as you said, who is trying to end American democracy. Correct. Not so as I, we I, know I, it. I, Let's I, just say trying to end American democracy, period. Yes. I so, mean, they so, tried but, to steal an election. To be clear, yeah. that is what yeah. they did. They tried to steal an election. There was a case, in, there is a case in Georgia because they tried to steal an election. And then to try to get rid of that case, they tried to distract us with salacious gossip that we all watched because it was very compelling daytime television. The judge then says, it does not rise to the level of disqualification. They thought that Fonnie Willis and this case was going to be an easy target. They thought that they could take her out. They thought that the system was not going to side with her. They thought because she had the audacity to seek accountability, she had to be silenced. Well, Fannie Willis is still here. The Georgia election meddling case is still ongoing. And at this point, it is the only case where anyone has pled out guilty. 
On and it also is the only case yeah. if you talk to legal experts that uh, away from the TV set, uh, if you talk to them off camera and you say, okay, break these four cases down, what, what, what is the most likely to get people that were engaged in this conspiracy uh, justice finally? Like the people on January 6th that beat the hell out of cops, started a riot to steal American democracy, they're in jail. What's the most likely to get Trump and the people around him in that moving in that direction? They also say it's this Georgia case. Yeah, and there's a reason for that, which is that, you know, these issues are very complex. If you look at the 90 some indictments, these are complicated cases with lots of facts, lots of legal questions. When you have, as you do in the Georgia case, a phone call that everyone can hear and many, many, many people have heard, it reminds people of things they've watched on television. It's accessible. It, in a way, it's a case, uh, as Simone was rightly saying, about stealing an election that is very legible to people. And, the, and it was a, a crime conducted, you know, in the light of day, now recordable for everybody here. So I think that's been very, very helpful. And it's a case that at one level is very simply factual about what events that happened, but is about the highest level of crime you can commit in this country, which is to terminate the ongoing functioning of the republic. Yeah. You know, um, uh, Simone, it's so funny you talked about it makes compelling daytime TV. <laughs> I guess I don't like compelling daytime TV because I actually didn't want to ask you guys questions about this case. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about uh, Kamala Harris only because, I, yeah. you know, the legal people handle it. I think if you want to ask me what's compelling right now, and, 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 and Trump extremists don't want to admit it. People on other networks don't want to admit it. I think what's compelling, and we were going to play, we were going to play second half of a focus group, wide world news focus group, that had Democrats talking about how Kamala Harris has so changed in their minds and they're becoming more confident in her leadership abilities, more confident in the things she's doing. And, and most, especially the women in these focus groups, were talking about what she's doing defending women's health care. Uh, it's pretty remarkable what she did yesterday, isn't it? It's extremely remarkable. I mean, to be clear, prior to yesterday, no vice president, no president had ever set foot in a facility that provides abortion care. She went to a Planned Parenthood facility in St. Paul, Minnesota. I, I think it's important to underscore that Planned Parenthood facilities, they do more than administer abortions. There are people that, that go to Planned Parenthood for their primary care. And to have the Vice President of the United States of America uh, in that facility yesterday, visiting with patients, um, her, her team has, has reported, has said to uh, our colleagues in NBC News that they, the Vice President wanted to be clear that she didn't want to disrupt any operations, but she wanted to go there herself and see and hear and shine a spotlight on women and families in this country. And one of the things that she said, she spoke, I believe, for about 20 minutes at that facility, is she talked about the, the, the fear that uh, women and young girls have across this country because politicians want to tell them what they can do with their bodies. Politicians across this country feel like they know better than women do. And, uh, you know, there, there are a few things that the few things more important from the White House perspective that the White House can do than use their bully pulpit. And to and her presence is extremely important and frankly has been key to elevating this issue. In the midterm elections, there was going to be a red wave, everybody remember? I'm a red jacket on today. The red mm -hmm. wave did not materialize because of uh, part, a large part due to the concerns that folks had about the overturning of the Dobbs decision, uh, part, the Dobbs decision, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And so the elevation of that issue was, in fact, the vice president. And I'm not surprised that the folks in that focus group are, are seeing that because she has been a, just a mm -hmm. dedicated champion on this and other issues. And